What's up, everyone? I'm a fan of almost all entrepreneurs. Obviously not some, but it's fairly rare that we actually see someone indicted in any country that actually beats the case. And I'm mainly referring to like dark net drug cases here. Sam Kariagiozzi's rise in the business world started with fairly humble beginnings. Uh, he was born to Greek immigrants in Australia, and he worked his way up from modest jobs to eventually building a multi-million dollar empire, which was primarily through ventures in cryptocurrencies and things like hospitality, which is a unique spin on, on both of those things. You know, the introduction or fusing of crypto would probably be you know, pretty interesting models to see going forward of people who only accept those kind of things with their establishments. But he's best known for funding Savolki GR, a chain of Greek fast food outlets that offered an innovative kind of twist on, on the norm, which allowed people to pay in crypto. His foray into the world of crypto began when he founded Ozcoin in 2017. Sam had a vision of making cryptocurrencies accessible to everybody, um, including everyday Australians, and promoting Ozcoin as a form of payment at his business and positioning it as a you know, legitimate alternative to the traditional financial system of you know, tracking and serial numbers. At its peak, Ozcoin gained traction with thousands of investors and over 1,200 Bitcoin ATMs that was set up around the country as part of the company's expansion plan. It was during this period of success that Sam's reputation as a self-made entrepreneur became synonymous with his public persona, and he went ahead and actually had that tattooed on his hands, self-made. However, the volatile nature of the cryptocurrency market, combined with things like increased scrutiny by Australian law enforcement on things like crypto-related activities, brought his rapid success under the radar of I would say authorities, but in this case, I would absolutely say authoritarians. The investigation uh, began with how most investigations began with them learning about something and beginning to look into it. And in 2019, the Australian Federal Police, or AFP, arrested Sam, saying that he was basically this central figure in a dark web drug trafficking syndicate. And according to the AFP, the syndicate was responsible for importing 30 kilos of cocaine and methamphetamine into Australia. These drugs, valued at millions of dollars, were allegedly brought in through more than 100 international mail parcels, which the AFP believed were orchestrated through dark web platforms and funded with Bitcoin. And we can already tell right off the bat that there's a ton of we think, we believe, you know, there's probably a lot of mays, maybes, and could be's in these actual statements, communications between the AFP, if we could ever get our hands on them. It would, it would definitely be interesting to see something like that. Of course, we don't have access to that, so it's, it's what it is. We'll never actually know. But the investigation into Sam and his associates was basically part of this larger global effort by law enforcement agencies to try to crack down um, on the increasing use of darknet market activities. And in the years leading up to his arrest, global agencies, including the FBI, Europol, and AFP, had basically tried to ramp up efforts to try and shut down darknet marketplaces. Then we saw this in prior years with markets like Silk Road and Alpha Bay and Hansa, which were you know, absolutely notorious for facilitating the sale of drugs, in some cases weapons, and other you know, illicit services using cryptocurrencies. Although I will point out that Hansa was a fluke. That wasn't because of uh, you know, investigational prowess. It was just dumb luck. A third-party provider basically contacted um, the police and said, hey, here's where the server is. So, but in Sam's case, the AFP claimed that his involvement in cryptocurrency provided the means for laundering the proceeds of these illegal sales, right? So at the time of his actual arrest, Austrac, which is Australia's anti-money laundering agency, 
moved quickly to do things like suspend the licenses of two digital cryptocurrency exchanges linked to SAM. And this action was part of an ongoing effort by Austrac to clamp down on uh, or what they saw, anyways, as the misuse of digital currencies for things like money laundering and other illicit activities. Money laundering is always the prime thing they love to cite when shutting things down or taking things over, which it's just hilarious that that's always their convenient excuse. However, by suspending the exchanges and freezing his assets before any conviction was actually secured, authorities effectively delivered a death blow to a lot of Sam's businesses well before he was ever actually proven guilty. I mean, is are people like innocent of proven guilty? Is it is like, you know, pre-crime, like we're gonna prevent crime by by taking your business over. I mean, this might be partially understandable if he was like going around committing violent acts or maybe stealing from others or committing blatant fraud, but that just wasn't the case in this case. These kind of tactics that are used by all different types of law enforcement globally, like aren't new. These are things that typically are used in other high profile cases that involve things like cryptocurrency and dark net market activity where authorities, rather than waiting for a verdict or, you know, any kind of actual confirmation, anything substantive, even just that, right? They seize assets, they freeze accounts, and they impose crazy restrictions on individuals long before they ever step foot in a courtroom. And like the danger, of course, is that such aggressive moves can absolutely ruin lives and businesses. And they do that on a daily basis. Even if the accused is ultimately exonerated, there's no, you know, even consideration of the effects that throwing that rock in the pond might ripple out too. And the government's ability to act as both prosecutor and executioner of a business without the burden of proof brings us, or well, Australians rather, you know, dangerously close to a system where being accused is, you know, as damning as being convicted. So as a result of the investigation, more than two million in assets belonging to Sam were seized. And this included things like real estate, cars, and a significant amount of cryptocurrencies. These assets were frozen under restraining orders issued by the AFP as part of charges dealing with proceeds of crime. Of course, they couldn't actually substantiate this crime, but despite these developments, Sam basically maintained his innocence, asserting that, you know, while being wrongfully targeted because of his high profile involvement in crypto, he spent six months remanded in jail following his arrest but was later released on bail in late 2019. As the years went on, Sam became increasingly vocal about the actual toll of the legal process and like what it was taking on his life and his business. His assets remained frozen and his businesses struggled to survive amid the negative press and you know prolonged court proceedings. But Sam remained defiant, frequently stating that the AFP had no actual solid evidence to back up their claims and was basically claiming that, you know, ultimately the case would fall apart. Someone stops telling us fairy tales and we're listening. Hey, uh, come on, huh? What made you change your vote? He didn't change his vote. I didn't. Oh, fine. I know it. Would you like me to tell you why? No, I wouldn't like you to tell me why. AFP's decision to seize Sam assets and suspend his business before any criminal conviction really reveals kind of a dangerous overreach of power by a government organization. So basically by freezing his assets based on suspicion alone, the AFP effectively destroyed his financial empire without proving any guilt. So by definition, he would have been better off on like welfare or, you know, a menial job. And this kind of stuff like is, is a clear violation of the presumption of innocence where punishment was inflicted through the arrest and seizure and business closure long before Sam ever even saw a courtroom. So I know a lot of people who, you know, have discussed some of the more authoritarian moves 
of governments, including our Australian government. Um, but I think it's worth it to point out that in Australia, people still have the presumption of innocence. Like it's it's not a small thing that we're discussing here at all. It's it's you know it's you know it's just like over here in the U.S. we have the same you know presumption of innocence. It is in fact a fundamental right which comes from both common law and other things like, you know, international agreements. And one of those international agreements is called the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, or for short, ICCPR. If you look into it, Article 14 of the ICCPR, which Australia has indeed ratified, states that everyone charged with a criminal offense has the right to be presumed innocent until proven guilty. There's no, you know, context in there where you can say that this is supposed to be subjective in any way. I mean, I guess if I were playing like devil's advocate, I could say that perhaps, you know, they had found evidence that showed that, you know, he may have committed a criminal offense, but this isn't justification for what they did. And, you know, the, the answer is like, well, why isn't it, right? And, you know, my answer to that would be, well, because of Section 13.1 of the Criminal Code Act of 1995, which is in Australia. And this basically very clearly places the burden of proof, not on someone like Sam, but on the prosecution, which has the power of the state, the authority of the state, um, and, you know, a lot more money, which absolutely reinforces with concrete what we pointed out in the ICCPR about the presumption of innocence being a fundamental right, even in Australia. Um, and this tactic of, you know, asset freezing is part of a much larger pattern by the AFP and really, I mean, all law enforcement everywhere, basically where civil standards of proof are used to do things like steal or retain assets making it easier to cripple businesses without solid, solid evidence, which also helps them break someone to take a plea deal sooner, right? And the reality is that once those assets are actually seized, even if the person is later found innocent, that damage is irreversible. And we're talking financially, but obviously this absolutely applies to reputation as well, which is even more valuable in many cases. In turn, the government quickly moves away from trying to do something like serve justice, um, instead moves to launching preemptive strike against innocent individuals under the guise of justice. And it sets a precedent that should be really concerning for anyone in business, especially those involved in things like cryptocurrency or maybe finance or other things that may be scrutinized in the future by the government. And also, this isn't just about cryptocurrency or the darknet. It's about the fact that the government didn't like something that he was doing or thought it was shady and destroyed his business or tried to because of it. And by mid-2023, the prosecution against Sam was showing massive signs of degradation. The primary issue was the lack of conclusive evidence to actually support any charges of drug trafficking. Again, this would beg the question of why all his assets were seized in his business, you know, to begin with. I mean, you know, how do you justify that? If there was a primary lack of evidence to begin with, how is it justice to, to take someone's, you know, everything that they've earned and work, you know, their whole life for? I mean, obviously, investigating anything inside of an ecosystem that's, the, like the dark net, which is incredibly complex and difficult, um, is is hard to do. And, and I get that, but at the end of the day, they're also required to follow the law. And Section 13.1 of the Criminal Code Act in 1995 that I mentioned earlier. And at no point was it Sam's mandate or responsibility to prove his innocence, but rather it was always the burden of the government to prove his guilt. And the Australian Federal Police relied on things like blockchain analysis and you know the case against sam as a tool that you know, is often held up as a breakthrough in tracking the the flow of 
cryptocurrency specifically. And this is kind of reminiscent of like the FBI just giving up the ability to actually do an investigation depending on snitches or cops depending on forensics and, you know, losing the ability to actually do a real investigation. But here's the actual problem. Blockchain analysis shows transactions, right? Um, but it doesn't show intent. It's like trying to convict someone of drug trafficking because they use cash in a totally legal transaction. Trying to cite that you know, somehow it's suspicious and therefore that suspicion itself is some form of evidence is, <laughs> is hardly damning at all without more evidence because that's not really evidence. You see what I'm saying? Like, that's exactly where the AFP failed from my very limited understanding of the case, obviously. But while blockchain analysis has worked on certain cases, like we saw in like Silk Road and Alphabet, where you know there's actually clear evidence that tied individuals to criminal enterprises. In Sam's case, the AFP simply didn't have any of that. They pointed to Bitcoin transactions and the use of cryptocurrency as if it was enough to convict him of running a drug syndicate. They couldn't connect Sam to drugs, the dark net marketplaces, or clear criminal activity of any kind. Sam's lawyer also revealed that much of the evidence was actually circumstantial at best, which, I mean, just topically we can look at and kind of see from, you know, the, the overt actions that were actually done. There were inconsistencies in how the AFP handled the investigation, including things like improper gathering of evidence, misinterpretation of blockchain transactions. So even like the solid evidence that they had, they had screwed up themselves. So, you know, at the end of the day, we just call it what it is. as just trash work. The prosecution couldn't tie Sam to the alleged drug imports, but they still had the nerve to try to put him through five years of legal hell. Like five years. That's, you know... <laughs> They, they dragged this case out for half a decade only to drop all the charges in September of 2023, basically admitting that they couldn't meet the burden of proof that was actually required for a conviction. The Commonwealth Director of Public Prosecutions gave no detailed explanation for the actual sudden dismissal, which isn't a shock, but the message was you know pretty clear, like actions speak louder than words. Um, and what they were saying is we don't have a case. You know, we wasted how much money of our, you know, our taxpayers and how much time and, but anyways, unlike here in the United States, this, like, this kind of case is actually refreshing for someone like me to see. Like, if you were over here, uh, they, <laughs> they would have simply hit him with tax evasion or like, you know, some just nonsensical catch-all conspiracy charge. And just been like, here, hold that 10. You know, they'll give them 10 years. Um, and it's it's actually really kind of depressing to know that the AFP was, you know, way out of line at the end of the day in this particular case. They still, even though they were like way out of line, they still seem miles ahead of the U.S. federal system that, you know, you know, would have ended up giving them 10 years. They would have just found something and charged them with it. Um the AFP basically had used its power to seize assets and destroy a business based on a flimsy case that was built completely on circumstantial evidence. They acted first and then asked questions later. And by the time the case was actually dropped, the damage was done. And this is government overreach, basically. Uh, at its Not at its finest, because here in the U.S., I think we have kind of perfected that. But punishing someone economically and socially before proving guilt is is horrible or even worse like in sam's case they can't even build a coherent argument to take him to trial even after half a decade they've had half a decade to do this and they still can't do it so it's absolutely a dangerous precedent if the government can you know just destroy someone's life and business based on suspicion alone and in case no one's really safe Hopefully you don't do anything that they disagree with. It's a classic example of authoritarian tactics that are disguised as law enforcement. And the fight for asset recovery with criminal cases 
now behind him, um, Sam's attention has turned into recovering the assets that were actually frozen during the investigation. Speaking to the media, he expressed relief at the conclusion of the legal battle, but reiterated his frustration with the justice system, which is absolutely understandable. He described the process as surreal, pointing out that it had taken nearly six years to clear his name, during which time he lost not only viable assets, but also significant business opportunities. Um, and I would also point out, you know, you might add some depreciation too, man. Um, like over here, uh, you know, if we look, just look at grocery prices or gas prices, you know, um, how much your money was worth five years ago, you know, thanks to inflation, you're basically getting robbed, but no one's actually taking the money from you. Sam turned around and announced his intent to seek legal action to recover the frozen assets, which he described as his life work. So to me, this was very reassuring and, and very cool to see. Anyone who's had to deal with court systems, no matter what it's for, it could be divorce, criminal, you know, whatever, um, can absolutely tell you that one of the things that they rely on here um, is typically exhaustion, right? Uh, in criminal cases, they love to take you, throw you into like a horrific county jail, uh, you know, for years <laughs> until you just sign a plea agreement saying that you're guilty just to, to get the hell out of there. They try to basically exhaust you mentally, emotionally, and financially. Seeing Sam have the strength and the endurance to finish up a six-year court battle and then turn around and say, now you're going to pay for poking me in the eye, more or less is very inspirational to someone like myself. His legal team is reportedly preparing to file a claim to regain control of the properties and vehicles and cryptocurrency holdings, which they basically just stole. And they never gave back. They just took it. They're like, it's ours now. Um, in connection with the nonsensical charges. The outcome of this legal effort, you know, is going to be a whole new battle all in itself that he's choosing to fight. Things like asset recovery cases can absolutely be, you know, very complex and time-consuming and expensive. This is even more so when things like large sums of money are involved. Like the government doesn't want to give you back all that stuff and valuable properties. I would say that he's absolutely doing the right thing by showing the government that he's not, you know, just going to allow them to bully him and and not have to pay anything for it. Uh, mind you, even if he loses his civil case, like at least he's stepped up, at least he's shown that he's willing to fight. And I think at the end of the day, that's where some of the true honor really lies in this entire case. It's like, you know, even if you, you're going up against a giant, you're still going to stand up and at least try to fight. It was one of the single most important points that I really, really hope to get across to you, you know, watching this video um, in regards to this case. And I think that, you know, it's one of the best ways that you can point out the things that are wrong is to, in some cases, when you can, use the same system that they're using against you, against them. And, you know, obviously I'm a, I'm a huge fan of this kind of tactical methodology uh, because it's what I used to get out of prison. And that said, unfortunately, a lot of the time, especially here in the United States, it's absolutely a dead end <laughs> because the system is purposely designed to exhaust you and make moving in it virtually impossible. So it was really cool to see someone in a position where they were being attacked, uh, especially for something like a, a darknet charge relating to narcotics. And just demolishing court through time. Um, that was that was really interesting to see. And keep up the good work, Sam. I hope that your businesses come back. Um, and I will see you in the next video.